Hi, in the couple of minutes that we have, can I see if I can share? I need sharing rights, please, from the host. Host is disabled sharing rights. Please, can we share? Can we assist Prof to share? And good evening, good evening, Prof Yen. Thanks for coming through. Good evening. I'm Conrad. Can you assist Prof? Give the sharing rights there. Uh, hi, Dr. Nguanya. Monday is also in, so he's going to do that. So I'm oh, going to okay. start the meeting at like half past six. So Monday is jumping in now. Then he's going to drive you through. Okay, Monday, if you can just assist, please, and give um, Prof. Yen rights to share his screen. It says make. I'm, I'm making you as a host now, so you can make him as a host. So I'm leaving now. Okay. Have you been sorted, um, Prof. Sunny? Uh, yeah. Let me just see. Yes, I, I can okay. now. Excellent. I can now, should be now, be able to share. Uh, what up? Um, are you seeing my presentation now? Perfect. I'm seeing just your screen, but not the presentation. You're seeing the presentation there on that now on your we, side? Now we see the presentation, and that's perfect. Now, sorry. Perfect. We see it perfectly. Okay, excellent. Um, I'm going to just end it for the moment so we and stop sharing and then we'll share it when the time's right. Thank you very much. Great, right, thank you. <clears throat> uh, Monday, if you can also just enable my 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 camera, okay, kindly. Uh, doctor, you just need to click on your camera on the bottom right. Mm -hmm. I've done that. And then it says integrated virtual video filter. Because when I click on the camera, it says you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Let's just have a look because I'm not seeing an option for that. I think we just have to all be co hosted. Yeah, I'll just set it so. now. Try it now, doctor. That's better. Great. Good evening, colleagues, and good evening to everyone who's joined us this evening. 
I'm really thanking you for taking the time out to be able to, to join us for this um, interesting um, session that we are going to have. It is a CPD um, accredited, and I trust all of you have um, indicated and stipulated your, 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 your information as per the registration sheet. Um, we are about to start as of now, we've got about 386 participants. Um, what I will kindly ask is just um, three to five minutes, and then we will start um, today's discussion. We do have about 1,200 that have um, confirmed to attend the meeting. So kindly, as we just um, sort out the last minor technical issues, we, we kindly ask that you indulge us um, with three to five minutes at most, after which we will resume. Um, or rather start our session. Thank you. So those who are joining uh, at the moment, we're just uh, giving a chance for everybody to join. Great, thanks for that, Prof. Uh, Angie? Good evening to all our colleagues. I see our numbers are going up. We we did take, um, we were meant to start at um, half past five and it is now 25 to um, six. And so we, we will keep to schedule. We've got um, 500 odd that have joined, still expecting another 530 to be able to join. But um, respecting those um, who have joined um, and, and um, keeping, you know, to the session and the time that we have, we said we would start, we are going to start this session. My name is um, Olani Edward Nguenya, 
and I am um, currently a board member in the South African Medical Associations, and I chair the Eastern Highfield branch, which um, has been responsible for, for, for organizing this event. Um, the South African Medical Association um, really has, 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 has gone all out um, in trying to get as much information out um, to many of our healthcare members um, who, who, who are experiencing problems and who may have issues and questions, um, a number of questions without answers. So this um, is an opportunity to share some light and there, are, there is a lot of frustration that may be there. And I think majority of it is just because um, there's some information that's not known. And hence we have Prof Sani who's here to join us, um, who has agreed to speak to us regarding the rollout and the issues surrounding vaccination. So we ask this to be an interactive session. We will give an opportunity at the end for questions and answers just to go through the, um, the um, um the 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 logistics um just to give you um we will be having a presentation with prof sane and if you can see at the bottom if there's a question that you have kindly type it in the q and a area and there we will be collecting all the questions and answering them there um let's perhaps try to avoid um raising the hands or um using the chat area as we'll be predominantly focusing on the q and a area. Um, with us um, forming the panelist is Dr. Angeli Kutsia, um, who's the chairperson of our board of directors at SAMA, a very close colleague and friend, um, and someone who's, who's really well attuned with information who will be able to help answer some questions. Um, good morning. Good evening, Angie. I almost said good morning. Dr. Kutsia, you are muted. Just want to say hello to all um, members of SAMA and non-SAMA members, and a, a very special welcome to Prof. Ian Sane, who is always willing to help and assist us. And I also would like to thank um, Eddie for um, having this brilliant idea to bring this to his branch and then decided it is such an important topic that he would rather bring it to the bigger um, fraternity of medical healthcare workers and medical doctors. So thank you so, so much um, for being here. And Eddie, I, uh, you, congratulations on your attendance. Um, people here tonight, uh, I, I think we're going to look forward to hear Prof. Ian Sane. Um, there's nothing that Ian doesn't know or understand. Um, regarding the Sasanka project, and please ask your questions. And um, I, I see there's some hands raised. I'm not sure whether we're going to go on to hand raising. Uh, I think that's going to be difficult. But thank you so much. Um, Ian, you're welcome. Over to you and um, Eddie. Thank you very much, Dr. Kutsia. I really appreciate you, Angie. Um, and just last to perhaps add um, on our panelists, we also have Dr. John Musonda, very close colleague, member of our branch. He is our district um, physician and, and certainly the one who heads up um, within the area, the, the eastern side, the vaccination program. And Dr. Musonda, Welcome, if you may just show yourself and you may just have a few words before then we introduce um, Prof. Ian Sane. Yes, good evening and uh, welcome everybody. We, we are happy to, to have you this evening and I hope we are going to have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Musonda, and really most welcome here. Thank you for joining us. And um, we have Prof. Ian Sane. Um, for those of you who don't know him, which I think must be um, a very, you know, few minority prof, Sane is, the, is a professor of medicine um, in the University of the Witwatersrand, which is my alma mater and will forever love. Um, and he, he is a director um, of the Clinical HIV Research Unit. Um, as a matter of fact, he's also the founder and CEO of Right to Care, um, which is a nonprofit organization. He has around how many publications? Must be 280 peer-reviewed publications that you that you have. Um, the Prof. Ian, I think I'm I'm way behind 
Um, there's a lot I'd need to catch up. Um, <laughs> and, and, and he is the member of the Sisonke leadership um, for the vaccine study, coordinating um, that, and the member of the Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID. Um, Prof. Ian Sane, thank you very much for joining us. We have so many questions. I'm a surgeon. I know very little regarding um, you know, some of the technical issues. I hope you'll break it down and make it easier for us and most of our members who are here. And we have so many questions. We're not sure what's happening. There's, um, there's others who've gone to Steve Pico, others who've registered and are now employees of Kresani Paraguana Hospital um to get vaccines um and there's other institutions where are we what do we have we've got a trial what is a phase 2b um what is a phase 2a um and are we on a rollout or are we on a clinical trial um where are we currently with this where 500 vaccines are they for free were they donated these are some of the questions that will come your way, Prof. Sane, and you are most welcome. Thank you for joining us. Without further ado, over to you, Prof. Ian Sane. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rilani and uh, John and uh, Anjali. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Please confirm that you can see this slide. Perfect, we can see it. Um, thank you very much. All right, super. Thank you very much. I'm here on behalf of a very large uh, team of uh, collaborators that came together uh, just at the beginning of February uh, to uh, make, um, I think, what was an incredible move, and that is to bring uh, the j, j vaccine to South Africa. Uh, just uh, in history, uh, we realized that when the AstraZeneca results presented by Professor Shabir Mahdi demonstrated that AstraZeneca, in fact, had um, a very modest modest viral uh, vaccine efficacy, uh, we realized that we needed to make an interim solution. Um, so it was very rapidly brought together um, to, and a request was made to the J&J &J team uh, to make the remaining vaccines available from the clinical trial supply to South Africa. And I think uh, all credit goes to the two chairs, uh, Glenda Gray and Linda Gale Becker, uh, for in fact bringing this together. Uh, we became involved because one of the ensemble sites was indeed our research site. Uh, and so they, we were requested to become involved because I, I've had now um, 12 months of experience of working with the Department of Health on the COVID response. Um, I was uh, quite concerned, in fact, that this, the scale, the rapidity at which this uh, program was being rolled out and became involved in the core leadership of, um, of the study. In principle, we have um, uh, a adenovirus backbone, um, a vaccine that has been used. The backbone has been used in a number of indications. Um, this was adapted for uh, COVID. But indeed, there were a number of completed trials and indications in HIV, Ebola, malaria, respiratory sensitive vi uh, virus, Zika, amongst others. Um, the adenovirus backbone has been used in multiple countries. It has uh, been demonstrated to be very safe and effective, and therefore lended itself to a rapid adaptation uh, to the coronavirus. Uh, and in fact, uh, there were a number of vaccine programs, I'm sure you've heard of many of them, um, that have been ongoing, uh, substantively supported by the NIH. And so in fact, the J&J &J program was also supported by uh, the NIH. Multiple vaccine candidates have gone through a selection process. Um, the vaccine part of it, um, uh, in this instance was to focused on the spike protein, the so-called S protein of the virus, uh, with uh, basically multiple constructs designed and until they were optimal and stabilized. Uh, this component, interestingly enough for coronavirus, uh, took anything between three and six weeks. People ask why was this possible? 
And that was possible because the technology had been established over the last 15 years predominantly for in the, in the world in the realms of HIV. Uh, the selection criteria of which vaccines would go forward um, and that those included the, the ability of this va uh, vaccine construct to express the antigen, the scalability of production, and we're, we're literally, even though the, the platform's chosen, today we are very concerned about the scalability of vaccine uh, to reach uh, billions of doses. Uh, the early indications of immunogenicity, and I'll show you some of that data, and then uh, theoretical considerations such as stabilization and signal peptides, et cetera, which are secondary considerations. To give you an understanding, so the first candidates went through quite quickly, but the later candidates, um, so there were two candidates from Merck um, that were, looked very promising. But indeed, in uh, phase one data did not show enough immunogenicity, and it was in fact decided to disband uh, the Merck program. They are coming back with more candidates uh, further down the road, but to give you an understanding that not every vaccine has actually moved forward into uh, clinical trials. Um, on this slide, this is the early uh, preclinical data, but what I'd like you to remember is, th is this curve here uh, to show, in fact, the neutralizing antibodies that were produced. And we're seeing that indeed uh, the first emergence of neutralizing antibodies is as soon as seven days, and it goes up uh, and is complete at about 28 days. So this uh, curve is important to remember, and, and I'm certain there will be questions related to uh, the actual uh, immunogenicity and when the reliance on the vaccine, when the, when the best um, immune response uh, is achieved. So uh, then there were uh, challenge studies undertaken, and you'll notice on the left are the controls. The controls outnumber the vaccine uh, because in fact they brought some uh, sham immunized animals from, uh, from other studies together to in fact ensure that the curve was complete. But you'll notice that in fact the adenovirus 26 cov 2 protein um, vaccinated animals when they were challenged in fact uh, there was protective immunity both in the lower and upper respiratory tract. Uh, this led then to a decision that, in fact, the key features of this vaccine is that it's a monovalent vaccine, so it has only one protein. Uh, it is mutations um, um Ian we losing you completely yeah so it's not just my network eh that, that's always so interesting that's the first thing <laughs> one check is your own network and then you're waiting for someone else there's prof right. is back Oh, Prof is back. Prof, we just we just missed you there for the the last parts of what you were saying. If you could kindly come back, sorry. I think your connectivity cut. Can, can you see? Me? Um, still not hearing you. We we see the screen that you're sharing now. Can you see my slides? Beautiful. Yeah. Now we see your slides. Yes, and we can hear you. Well, I'm just going to move while I'm speaking. Um, okay, so I'll leave the video off. Hopefully that'll help the connectivity. Um, all right, so on the next slide, uh, there was then in phase one and two, a variety of persons that were vaccinated over a, uh, in, in three co cohorts, uh, both the younger age group and older age group. Uh, and a, a continuous cohort to understand uh, the 
uh, long-term effects of how long these the antibodies remain in place. Uh, the results of that study showed that specializing antibody teachers uh, were detected in more than 90% of all participants by day 29 after first vaccine dose and 100% by day 57. So there is a portion of people who require longer to establish the full immune response. Um, the other immune component, the CTL responses, were in fact also demonstrated and detected in 76 to 83 percent of participants in the younger age group and less so in the older age group. We believe that both antibody and CTL responses will be required to have uh, complete protective immunity. The safety profile has been very um, uh, uh, has been as expected, with some vaccine reactogenicity leading to fatigue, headache, myalgia, and injection site pain. As doctors move forward, I, we, we are finding that indeed some of the injection site pain can be worse if the needle used is not long enough to reach the uh, muscle. It is critical for immune reaction that this vaccine is deposited into the deltoid or other muscle groups and not into the subcutaneous uh, tissue. Uh, we have the ensemble study, which is the big phase three study that was then decided upon to establish the safety, um, efficacy, safety, and immunogenicity in adults. Uh, in particular, the, there was a review of um, uh, moderate and critical events after 14 days of vaccination. So the second endpoint was in fact severity of disease, both after 14 days and 28 days of vaccination. Uh, the overall results have been presented widely. In the United States, there was 72% efficacy, an overall worldwide efficacy, a viral effectiveness, in other words, a vaccine effectiveness of 66%. Um, uh, and in South Africa, due to the lineage, 90% of the uh, persons who did seroconvert had the B1351 uh, lineage, the so called. Uh, 501 V2 um, uh, variant. This led to only 64% protective efficacy. But what's really interesting is that uh, a 86% uh, reduction in severe disease, and there were no deaths in the treatment in the vaccine arm of the study. This is what the Kaplan-Meier curve looks like. And I'll remind you again of this 14 day period where in fact the immunogenicity has not been fully established. Uh, and it does take until the uh, up to 28 days for this to be a fully effective protective uh, vaccine. You'll notice that beyond the 35 and 42 days we had very few additional e events. So the safety um, report of the study showed that there was an overall um, rates of, um, well, so these are rates of unsolicited adverse events. Um, if they were, uh, they were balanced across both arms, unsolicited, but indeed when we asked all participants as to whether they had had um, reactions, injection site pain, et cetera, then 48.6% of vaccine recipients declared that they'd had that whereas 16.7% in the placebo arm. The most frequent adverse events included, again, headache, fatigue, myalgia, nausea, and fever. Uh, there were seven serious adverse events, that three of which were considered to be related or likely related to possible related and two unrelated to vaccine. Uh, these um, so immune processes are with, uh, or neurologic processes are commonly seen with vaccines, it was determined that the rate was too low to prevent the vaccine from going forward. Um, this is the table that shows those results and they, they are now published. So uh, we, you can look at these tables in more detail. Uh, key is the after 29 um, days back, um, uh, COVID rates. And there you can see the differences between the, the vaccine arm and the placebo arm. 
uh, at the bottom right hand side of the table that um, were broken down uh, into um, a seroconverted in the seroconverted group. So in summary, the adenovirus vector vaccine is a welcome addition to the vaccine repertoires to the mRNA vaccines that were registered first. Uh, the immunologic data is good with high neutralizing antibodies and good cellular immune response. And the phase three interim results were considered very encouraging. Uh, the important part of this uh, vaccine is that although it is transported at minus 20, uh, there is established uh, stability at two to eight degrees Celsius uh, for up to four weeks. Um, this is compared then to a number of other vaccines that I'm sure everybody has heard about. Um, the Oxford AstraZeneca results for the South African variant, unfortunately, do not look very good. Um, the, uh, uh, the vaccine efficacy uh, is now uh, estimated to be 22%, um, with uh, where indeed a 50% cutoff is considered uh, to be a uh, useful vaccine. AstraZeneca's study size and population was not large enough to measure the hospitalization events. We have no data for the so-called Sputnik V vaccine on the uh, efficacy in the, in the, uh, with our variant, with the South African do um, dominated variant. We do know from the laboratory testing that the Pfizer mRNA vaccine is, um, is now is effective, uh, although there is a one logarithm decline in the, um, in the uh, um, viral loads and um, binding efficacy of the uh, virus to the spike protein to the cell, to the ACE receptor. Um, in uh, the presence of serum from a Pfizer uh, uh, vaccinated participant. So we, the data is actually outstanding for Pfizer as to whether that vaccine will have the same sort of benefits uh, for severe disease, but we do think in fact, um, it will protect against severe disease. There are big concerns about the minus 70 have been addressed. It can be shipped at minus 20 between sites and once at site can be is useful at two to eight degrees Celsius for up to five days. Um, yesterday, the Novavax publication came out uh, and indeed, unfortunately, in the presence of our uh, um, uh, variant, uh, the um, viral, the vaccine efficacy was estimated to be only 10%. So that probably counts Novavax out for um, the future of our testing. There is little to no data on Sinopharm presented at this time. I do know that the Department of Health is looking at this, but the uh, regulator, the SAPRA is taking um, the limited data into account as we consider whether Sinopharm vaccine can move forward. Uh, on the, oops. Uh, this is the summary then of the ensemble trial results. It was tested in 43,000 people over four continents, including 6,500 participants in South Africa. It has an overall um, vaccine effectiveness or protection of 64%. But what is really important is that there is an overall protection against severe disease at 82% and at uh, the protection against death at 100%. This 82%, I think, has risen in the final publication to 85%. So what we did with the Sasonke program is to now consider if we can move this as quickly as possible into a program, an expanded program. No, it's safe, efficacious, and we know it's reasonably easy to roll out. I, I'll tell you that from my experience for the last three weeks or four weeks, that's easy to roll out is a very strong term. And Anjali has, uh, and others have met me at sites and uh, it has been quite challenging. But what we designed was a pragmatic real world th phase three clinical trial of a single dose of uh, COVID-19 vaccine 
for uh, frontline health care workers in South Africa. This was determined as the most important population uh, to begin vaccinating to ensure that we are able to protect our health care workers as quickly as possible and ahead of the, um, the next, um, uh, next wave of COVID-19. Uh, so this fits, although this is a and it does not uh, are doing this in, in uh, partnership with the National Department of Health, but it remains a study that is sponsored by the SAMRC. The um, uh, Sasanke program will eventually lead to full registration, will add data to the full registration of the vaccine, and will eventually lead to much larger supplies. The Department of Health has signed up 11 million doses of J&J vaccine to reach our shores over the next uh, couple, um, two quarters. Um, we, what we are, what Sasanke is, it is a research study. It is focused on healthcare workers, and it is essentially, in a way, providing early access, but it is a study. What, is, what it is not is a clinical trial that uh, has a placebo control arm. The clinical, it, uh, it, all participants are receiving active vaccine. It is, it, we are exploring, it, 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 it is not exploratory in terms of safety because we have got established safety. Uh, and therefore it is, uh, at the same time, it is not a government national rollout program. It is a study. And they have been going through lots of discussions on who is allowed to register. Uh, we have the EBDS systems. Many of the participants on the vaccine, if, if participants are eligible, an invitation is sent out uh, after consent. So there's an important consent step to participate in the study. The most important aspect of that consent is that uh, the product is not registered. But the second most important is that we are linking data from the clinical trial to the established databases of the NICD uh, laboratory testing, and we are linking it to hospitalization data from DATCOV. Once consent has been given, every participant is issued with a vaccination voucher and asked to attend a vaccine site with proof of ID and proof of employment or professional registration. We have progressively opened the um, Sasanke eligibility to include general practitioners in independent practice and more recently dentists, uh, independent specialists and physiotherapists. Uh, we are in hoping to in fact complete the uh, 7,200 7, hundred um, independent practitioners through the multiple sites over the next uh, two weeks. Uh, the uh, hospital groups, the big hospital groups and some of the smaller hospital groups that have participated uh, in, I believe, have now completed some 28,000 vaccinations and I'll show you uh, some of more of those now. We anticipate to reach three to 500,000 doses in total uh, before the end of April. And uh, at present are operating at 49 sites across nine provinces. We have focused on large hospitals, but have also now moved in to reach um, more rural areas of South Africa. And there is a, the, the press release uh, provided by Rudasa yesterday, uh, I think is uh, premature because in fact, we have got a number of rural sites and rural administration of vaccine underway. Uh, so uh, what uh, so some of the clinical concerns, we are seeing reactogenicity um, in about half of the population. We ask every person who was vaccinated to report their reactogenicity uh, through the online CRF that is provided in the fifth SMS that any participant receives. 
uh, we uh, have certainly uh, um, we we although this vaccine is safe in breastfeeding, it is not yet recommended in pregnancy in South Africa. The CDC has come out with pregnancy recommendations after the first trimester, but uh, we are in negotiation with SAPRA for the inclusion of healthcare workers who are pregnant uh, and who wish to receive vaccine. Uh, we, the, the data is good on uh, comorbidities and it is also good for HIV. So there were enough participants in the Sasanke trial to uh, recommend vaccination for HIV positive individuals. It is important that if, they, if someone has severe allergy that they should be uh, monitored more carefully we have had one significant allergic reaction that happened quite quickly with bronchospasm uh, in somebody who was otherwise known to have severe allergies. And so as doctors, we would ask you to uh, look out for your uh, patients in future uh, that, are, uh, that do have a history of allergy. This is the data as of 5.30 today, as of 3.30 today. So we have completed 165,649 uh, vaccinations across all provinces. Uh, the big, pro the big, the reason why uh, Gauteng, KZN, and Western Cape have be have predominant numbers is because we actually focused on those. Uh, that's where the biggest hotspots were in the second wave with the most admissions. Those are also the provinces with the most central and regional and uh, hospitals. Uh, we are, however, uh, anticipating a pivot away from the key metro areas uh, to more rural uh, sites in the next two weeks. Uh, there are a number of 2,280 paper rec records that are being back captured that are not included in the 165,000 doses. So in Hi, Ian. Uh, we've lost you again. Can you hear me now? Loud and clear. Is that better? Is that better? Yes. Uh, is that better? Yes. Okay. Apologies. Um, we are. We are. Um, you will receive a vaccine card as the lady is holding up, and eventually there will be a vaccine passport, which will be linked to your passport for travel and other necessary. Uh, um, situations. Overall, we uh, thank uh, Minister Nkise and the Department of Health for working with us. The Most of the sites were uh, Department of Health sites. Many of our private sector colleagues will have been vaccinated through private sector sites, um, but indeed uh, more than two-thirds of this has been conducted in the Department of Health. I hope I've been clear in my presentation and I hope that the connectivity held up and I will open the Q&A session now, but we'll hand back to the chair to discuss, uh, to take uh, things forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Prof. Yansane. Really, I think you actually answered a lot of questions that have been popping up on the Q&A. Um, so really grateful for that and appreciate the time taken. Um, before we open up to Q&A, if we may kindly, um, Dr. Musonda will just give some stats um, just to, to cover the region as promised um, in the area for, for the available sites, um, specifically within the region that it controls, um, which is the branch that we are representing. Um, Dr. Musonda, if you can just give us that five minute presentation and then we, we have a Q&A session. Thank you. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Uh, just to keep the, the discussion in context, I'm going to present something about the East Rand. Uh, yes, uh, the, in the East Rand, also called the Kuroreni, we've got six sub-districts, E1, uh, E1, E2, S1, and S2. And you see that uh, these are the stats from yesterday. You can, uh, just a minute. 
Yeah, you can tell that uh, the in in these are the active cases and these were the deaths. You know, in uh, any one and two, all these sub districts, we've got a cumulative number. Since the, the, the pandemic started, we've got uh, a cumulative number of 88,174. Active cases now are 490, and the deaths are 2,176. The new cases are on the downward trend with 40 to 60 cases per day for the last three days. And we've uh, case, re case recovery rate of uh, uh, over 99%. So that's what we only have 490, which are active cases. Our average weekly test positivity rate is 5% uh, compared to the average, I think, for the province, which is overing just above 10%. And deaths in the second wave, we had more deaths than the first wave in keeping with the rest of the country. And then uh, in terms of community and hospital deaths, they are tending to be underreported due to a lot of factors. In terms of community deaths, you have patients who die without being co confirming the diagnosis and they were not swapped. And then in hospital deaths, the reports do come, but they, they, should, they, they are not as quick as we would like them to come. And in new cases per day, you can see from the graphic presentation that uh, we are, this was around January and this was uh, June, July. The first year, this was the first wave. And we are somewhere here. You can see that the cases have really dropped. In terms of cumulative cases versus completed 10 days, again, here you see that the, the, the here the numbers are that the, the recoveries, you know, are, are much more than uh, have improved a lot. The number of deaths occurring per day. Yeah, you can also see that we are somewhere here. You know, they, are, they, are, they have dropped to less than five. And uh, in terms of the COVID-19 vaccine rollout, phase one, the, the, you will know that the number of vaccines expected in the country are limited and vaccination sites therefore could not be increased. They, have to, they can only be increased with the available uh, doses and vaccines. Tembisa, Reratong, and Sebokeng. Sebokeng is not in our area and Reratong. These are provincial. The one in our area is Tembisa. Was supposed to be an additional site from this week, but it couldn't happen because of the, the limited number of doses. And instead, Steve Biko was closed for as a vaccination site. And uh, in its place, a private, uh, in its place, the, the, uh, we, uh, the province added a private facility which will cater both for the private and, and the public sectors. The new private sector site, which was added is Medi, Medi Clinic, Med Forum, which uh, will cater for both private and public uh, health, healthcare workers. From Monday the 15th, we, the, the province received about 10,200 uh, uh, doses which were therefore distributed according to the sites. And more doses were expected as the week went by. This is the uh, new vaccination sites in, in Gauteng. You can see these were the, the existing ones and these were proposed to be the additional ones. But in the end, using uh, logistics and available resources and available vaccines, these were the doses, how they were distributed. You know, Ahmed Katrada is private, 800 doses. Uh, Charlotte Matleke, 2,300. Chris, uh, uh, Chris Honey Baraguana, 2,400. Uh, George Mukari, 2,100. And uh, Steve Biko, as we said, was discontinued as a site. Instead, we, the, the, the medical, the Medi Clinic, Med Forum was opened with 800 doses. Uh, Netcare, Meal Park, 800. So these are the, the six facilities in Gauteng at the moment who are vaccinating. And when we take it into context of uh, the East Rand, we are, our staff are getting vaccinated following this format. 
you know, Charlotte Maseki Johnsburg Academic Hospital are covering almost all our hospitals. You know, Bethatlawa, which is in Jamestown, uh, Far East Rand, and Springs, Kurule, I mean, uh, Pulusong in Kwatema. You know, we have Tambo Memorial, Boxberg, Tembisa Hospital itself. So all our hospitals are covered uh, for healthcare workers to be vaccinated through Charlotte Matleke, Johnsburg Academic Hospital. The rest of these are for, for other parts of the province. So in terms of vaccinations in, a, in, a, in the East Rand, we are covered in that way. And the phase two is the start, as it started in Henestry. We know that phase one has, will continue until everybody is vaccinated. The, the target of uh, about 215,000 health workers in Kaute. But when it comes now to phase two, we, we are now going to expand it to, to others. You know, the essential workers, the over 60 years old, the people in the con congregate uh, residential areas. And the, all these, we are going to be, we need to plan for them and we've started the planning in NST. So we've set up the working groups in the district with looking at different aspects of the vaccine coordination, governments coordination and uh, governance coordination and planning, identification of target populations and prioritization of, of stakeholders and the stakeholder analysis. This is a very big thing because it should it involves the private sector, involves the private pharmacies, it involves the social fair, education, prisons. It's, it's huge, and it's led through the district and the, the city of Ikurureni municipality. Then we have uh, service delivery platforms and vaccination readiness. All the sites must be must be accredited for to be able to be worthy as vaccination sites. And uh, that is, uh, we need first to identify the sites. You need to make um, them have connectivity. We don't want the paper exercise. We want everything to be done online. They capture and send. Then the human resources and training, obviously need to, to train the data capturers, the vaccinators, the you know, facility representatives, and the, and the health promotion, all that is being done in the process. Vaccine, code chain, and logistics. Here, we are using G&G &G at the moment as a, a study implementation step. But as we plan, we are planning for other vaccines. So the, in terms of uh, code chain, there are implications, and that's what we are trying to look at. If we get Pfizer, we need to really uh, to we need to to prepare adequately to be able to to keep vaccines at the minus seventy uh, degrees. Safety and security. This is big because we need to know from the the, the time the vaccines arrive to the time they, they are administered into a patient or a member community or health worker, at every step, the security, security must be tight. We know it, uh, it's a well sought after commodity and we, we need to be very tight with security. Data management, information systems and monitoring, very important. There are things we need to track. We need to, to track adverse events following uh, vaccinations or immunizations, we need to track uh, uh, refusal of vaccines, we need to track even the registration itself, and there are a lot of things we need to track there and the measure the, the performance in terms of uh, coverage. Communication demand creation, this is the essence of vaccination. We need to mobilize in such a way that we create demand, and we are doing that quite efficiently together with the city of Ikurueni. And also working with the support of the province and the, and the, and the premier's office, you know, the communication is streamlined in such a way that all the, all the myths are sort of addressed. It's a big, big project and the, we want everybody obviously to be involved. Uh, budgeting, it's in terms of what, how much these things will cost us. And we are, we, whatever budget we use, it's all cutted into there, including the, the HR budget. Healthcare, we cannot vaccinate without uh, managing the waste. And the waste management is huge. And we've got a capable team who are also looking into that. And above all, supporting partners. The, you know, ORAMS, the, we have shouted now, and the others who are helping us in terms of making uh, the vaccination process easier. So we are very, 
very uh, uh, earnest, in fact, in terms of looking at the phase two as well. As, as, well, as we finish phase one, we've, we're earnestly uh, preparing for the implementation of phase two because we, we think that we are, we are a, bit, uh, a bit short, a bit behind in terms of uh, the implementation. Thank you very much. That's the little I needed to tell you about uh, the East Rand in terms of vaccinations. Thank you. Dr. Musonda, thank you very much for that context that you've given us, um, at least contextualizing um, in the particular area, Ekuruleni um, municipality where we are um, with regards to vaccination. At this moment, without further ado, I'm going to open it up to the to um, our colleagues who have joined us and who have a number of questions to ask. Um, as I've explained on the panelists, we do have Dr. Musonda, we've got Prof. Ian Sane, whom we've heard, and we've got um, Dr. Angeli Kutsia, um, and I'll be assisting with just some questions. Um, so if, please, if there's anyone who'd like to take any question from the panelists, um, just let us know, and then we'll direct it in that manner. Perhaps the first question that I see, um, it appears the questions are broadly two groups based. Um, there's the clinical part um, regarding the vaccinations, and then there's the operational part, um, which you know most members um, and you know participants would like to know about. Perhaps the first question that I can put on a clinical um, aspect would be um, if that's coming here. It says. Um, with regards to people with allergies um, or any history of anaphylaxis, should they be taking, um, you know, the vaccine? As you have mentioned, um, Prof. Sane, that there was one who actually had quite a serious um, immediate um, adverse reaction. Um, so should, do, should we encourage them? So these are people with allergies. Further, there's another question that speaks about autoimmune disease. Um, that group also, if someone has an, a history of that, should they be taking the vaccine? And then the last other question, and I'm grouping them regarding um, the questions that I have here, regarding pregnant women. Um, one colleague asks, should we then encourage um, healthcare workers who are pregnant or lactating to receive the vaccination? Or is it an FDA category C? Um, should they not? What is your advice related to that? Um, perhaps, Prof. San, if you can um, take that and yeah, we'll go into more questions. Thanks. All right. Thank you for those questions. I think the question of allergy and severe and a history of anaphylaxis, I, I would recommend that a person with a history of anaphylaxis consider consulting their clinician. Uh, before deciding to vaccinate. However, we do believe that vaccines are important. Um, we would like to know about severe allergy and anaphylaxis because the observation period after vaccination is extended um, beyond the 15 minutes that everybody else and uh, that the actual ability of every site Every site has the ability to intervene for any um, moderate to severe allergic reactions that do occur. And we'd like that to happen on site rather than uh, let the person uh, go away. Um, we do not recommend any prophylactic dosing of antihistamines uh, before the vaccination. Um, and then the question on autoimmune disease, so I've had a number of participants um, across uh, my desk that have specifically asked about autoimmune disease. There is a international study underway to collect the data on all uh, people uh, with autoimmune disease or on immunosuppressants such as renal transplant patients um, to actually determine their vaccine effect and also their um, immune responses, but we have indeed vaccinated a number of people with autoimmune disease. Uh, to the question of pregnancy, I think that pregnancy uh, at this time, the FDA and EMEA have allowed for the J&J vaccine and Pfizer vaccine to go forward in, uh, for use in pregnancy. Uh, the first trimester is uh, um, recommended as an exclusion at this time. 
Uh, there is a big, uh, there are big studies underway for vaccination during pregnancy, uh, but the recommendation to use the vaccine in second and third trimester has been released by the FDA. We have an amendment into SAPRA to include uh, pregnant women in our study. At this time, it is a exclusion criterion until SAPRA has approved our amendment. Uh, and then in terms of lactation, there is, that is not an exclusion and uh, women who, who are breastfeeding their children uh, should in fact uh, be vaccinated. Uh, there was a group of questions which I'll address quickly, and that is how soon after vaccination, after soon after COVID disease, sorry, should somebody be vaccinated? The safety data uh, fairly consistently across all platforms has shown that uh, vaccination after 28 days uh, post the last symptom of COVID is safe. Uh, my own personal clinical bias is that if somebody who had severe COVID was hospitalized, particularly with immune, uh, hyperimmune responses to COVID, um, then I, my own personal bias would be to wait 90 days. Uh, the benefit of the vaccine is to uh, provide um, additional immune um, response and to uh, almost uh, drive the memory response uh, to COVID, uh, to COVID. Um, but I would be hesitant to vaccinate somebody who had severe COVID within 90 days of their last symptoms. I'm going to pause there. Um, uh, back to you, Chair. Uh, Chair, I think you're muted. Oh, and I'm speaking to myself. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, Prof, I really appreciate that feedback. Perhaps we can go to another question on the operational side, and then we'll come back to the clinical operational side. Questions that are being asked um, regarding what is the process um, for one to get a vaccine? Um, there are those who say, I've registered, but I still don't have a voucher. <clears throat> Do I need to register in many different sites? There are those who say, look, I'm not linked to any hospital. Um, I'm not a hospital-based doctor. What then happens to me? And then there, there, there are those who are asking, um, you know, this vaccination business, is it a passport actually? Um, I don't know if you can answer that. They say, is it a passport to travel? In other words, if I don't get it, clearly uh, you'll be blocked. The States won't want me, the UK won't want me. So is this actually a passport um, for travel? Um, perhaps we can just pause on the on the one there. I have answered some of them um, on the group uh, on where to go on the site. But who would like to take this? Would you like to take this, Angie, um, or Dr. Masonda? I can take I can, it. I can come in here and then Dr. John can 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 correct me. Great. But as far as Great. I know, um, that currently, if you travel overseas, the only thing that you need to have is that um, proof of a PCR less than seven, uh, 72 hours. That's the only thing that I'm aware of. Um, I know that there is um, noises make about a, a passport, but as far as I know, it's not on yet. Thanks. Thank you very much. Dr. Musonda, would you like to come in? Um, maybe even grab the other questions. Yes, thank you very much. I think I, I concur with, with Dr. Kose. And uh, the only thing is that uh, I think we are waiting for a situation where uh, governments are going to set the direction. But for now, with the PCR 72 hours, which we are, we are all depending on if we are traveling. Uh, but sooner or later, when I think vaccinations become more common and all that, it's possible that they will attach it into to travel. But it will need direction if, even from WHO maybe. But the thing is, if you want, then the other part of the question is that if, if you want to be vaccinated and we want everybody to be vaccinated, the, the first step is for you to, to fill up the electronic vaccine data system, you know, the EVDS, you need to, to complete that. And that's where now you, you put in the information whether you, are, you face the patient or not. Because the vaccination itself, because of the limitedness of the vaccines, 
it has to be uh, prioritization must take place. That's why we the, the healthcare workers have to be uh, in the four different categories. Who gets the vaccine to, to be prioritized? And the, although in practice we've seen that they are not, it's not always possible to follow these these steps. But that's what we should be doing because the vaccines are not adequate. So once you've done the EVDS, and then the second part is to complete the Sisonke. And the Sisonke part, which is agreeing to the study and the, and all those aspects of consent and all that. So you, the first step is the EVDS, and then which you can. We have healthcare workers who are not able to to to, to use computers, but they, we've got help. I know in one of uh, the hospitals around the, the health workers were, I mean, the volunteers were going from section to section to help others to to complete the EVDS the part of the, the vaccine. So once you've done that, then it's Sisonke for now, you also do that. And then you start, wait, you start waiting for the, uh, for the voucher. If you get the voucher, then you can, uh, you can actually go and get vaccinated. That's how, in short, it is. There are six steps which you need to follow. And uh, I, I, that's actually how you, 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 you then do it. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Masanda, um, for that. Um, and if, can I just, let, can me I just, add? let me just add on that here also. There is a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, correspondence and information from Department of Health, province as well as national. You, if once you've registered on the DCS, you apply to Sisonke, you receive a vaccination voucher number, you attend your vaccination site, you get the vaccine, then you receive the final SMS with vaccination proof code, because you're supposed to have proof once you've been vaccinated, which you now use as a, uh, as a, a proof. Thank you very much. Sir, would you like to come in? Yeah, so eligibility is all frontline healthcare workers, but there's a, the next step is practical implementation. And so the EVDS does in fact have, is registered to sites that are vaccinating. And in each of those sites, we have established catchment areas. Uh, Dr. Masondo um, presented the slide where the linked facilities in both public and private are linked to uh, the vaccination site. This is a progressive rollout. And so indeed, uh, we have progressively opened up the catchment areas to more and more hospitals. Uh, the next big population that came into eligibility were the, um, the hospitals, the B4SA um, coordinated hospitals and the hospital workers that are frontline COVID facing. In parallel, the V4 healthcare workers, vaccine for healthcare workers group um, uh, organized the general practitioners initially to be eligible, but have now taken on the role to for independent specialists and independent practicing pharmacists and the entire dental uh, workforce of South Africa to be registered with V for healthcare workers. That data is imported into the EVDS and all of those individuals have become eligible. Once a participant is eligible, they need to complete the consent and a vaccine voucher is issued. In most of the sites around South Africa, we have got uh, EVDS scheduling and a further appointment based, based on site date and time is provided to participants. If you are not receiving that time, uh, that uh, scheduling voucher, then it is because the site at the moment, the demand exceeds the available vaccine. The vaccine is coming in tranches. The Dr. Masonda spoke to 10,200 vaccines delivered on uh, Sunday, I believe it was this week, uh, but there is a further tranche um, arriving in South Africa on Friday, which will be larger in quantum than the, the prior. So instead of getting 40,000 vaccines, we are, this week we're getting 60,000 vaccines. We anticipate an uh, increased number of vaccines to come over the next three weeks. 
so in principle, if you have registered, you have got a vaccine voucher, but you don't have a date, that's because the site that you would be allocated to does not have vaccines at this time. Uh, if there is any independent practitioner who is not managing to get registered, um, then they should please uh, search the uh, V for Healthcare Workers platform uh, to find out how to register through that process. There's a hospital based practitioner who's not yet received their or their hospital has not been included in catchment as at this time, such as the Butterworth example. We are moving uh, from the current metro sites to more rural sites in the next uh, two weeks and your, your eligibility will um, become available. So Sonke can only be responsible for 500,000 healthcare workers vaccinated. The Department of Health will be taking over uh, with their supply of vaccine. Uh, in all discussions at present, the anticipation, um, anticipated arrival of uh, Pfizer vaccine in country will be at the end of this month or shortly after Easter. Uh, and that then the first population, again, that will be vaccinated with Pfizer will be the healthcare workers. So we do anticipate an ever increasing supply of vaccine. Uh, we hope to reach all healthcare workers uh, soon. Over. Thank you very much for that, Prof. Um, I, I think for the, the vaccination and the process, um, I see some other questions as well. What we, what we have done and what um, I'm now committing on behalf of summer that we are also going to do um, is by tomorrow also um, issue out an uh, information sheet, if you may, um, regarding exact steps that you can take if you are a government employed doctor, public sector, if you are private, if you are not attached to a hospital, um, what exactly, which steps should you follow? If you have a voucher, if your appointment has been canceled, what then to do? We've done that before, we'll issue it out. It should be out on Medigram chair. Um, we'll send that proposal so the media communications can have it out there. Um, so watch out for the med emails. And if you're not getting med emails, you're not a summer member. I would quickly register and be a summer member. A bit of marketing there. Thank you. The next question I'm seeing here, Dr. Mabisa is asking here. Um, look, we've heard a whole lot of media statements coming there. We don't know what to believe. Can, can we have some clarity, number one, on the recent media reports of possible increased risk of thromboembolism following COVID vaccination. I think that's probably a story that came out today, I think by the, about the AstraZeneca trials. So if someone can comment, is there an increased risk um, related to that? Um, maybe following that, another um, question that um, has been asked is to say, look, they are noticing that we are having a bit of complications, but between the group 30 to 50, is there any truth in that or indeed, um, there is a specific risk, um, call it a population group that um, is more likely um, to, to, to have adverse um, events, minimal, um, in not so severe. And then the next other, I think we've answered the media statement regarding placebo. Thank you. I think Prof has already sorted that out. There was a trial last year, just to inform everyone, um, where it was double blind, but this, I think, Prof Ian Sane has clarified phase 3B trial, there's no placebo. So no one has received any water related to that. And then perhaps a question that you may ask, thromboembolism um, was one. The second um, regarding then the, the, the um, after how long after I have tested positive for COVID, may I then receive the vaccine? Um, should I wait for two weeks, three weeks? Um, uh, how long should I be waiting? And I think other questions, if um, the panelists may choose to answer as they peruse um, through the Q&A area, we'll be also answering there. Who would like to take those questions regarding the, the increase, the side effects? What are the side effects perhaps? Is it true that there's an increased risk of um, VTE or DVT? Um, and and what, um, when should I take the vaccine after I've tested positive? I, I will wait for Ian as well to come in. 
but um, on the Pfizer and um, Johnson and Johnson, there is currently no um, a, a thrombo thromboelytic um, uh, or embolisms that we are aware of, DVTs, anything that we are aware of. We know that on the AstraZeneca, there's also about 40 incidents. Um, whether, whether that is, uh, you know, only related to AstraZeneca, we, uh, I, I'm not sure, maybe Ian can come on that, but or from, from um, uh, Johnson & Johnson, there is none. Then what we, what we do now, it, it seems that females tend to get a bit more reactogenicity after the vaccines. Um, that and reactogenicity has got nothing to do with the immune response at the end of the day, whether you will be, get immune response antibodies. Um, the, uh, and the, the reactogenicity only means that your body have a reaction against the injection itself and it can last for a day or two. It's more, most of the times a tenderness, can have a slight fever. You can have um, a bit of a body aches and chills, not feeling well. Uh, you can take um, an anti-inflammatory to, to get that better. And um, so there's not, a, that, there's not a huge bad inf uh, inf uh, uh, side effects that we are aware of, except the ones that, Ian said about the one person who had a severe reaction. Ian, you can help me out on this um, if I left out some of this. So the, the safety reporting that is being done to SAPRA every two weeks demonstrates a vaccine reactogenicity that is equal across the population uh, with uh, at this time about um, I, I didn't attend the call yesterday morning, but I think there were 3,700 reported events, and but they are equally distributed by gender and age. Uh, we do, the immune system in adult years is more reactive, and so it is conceivable that, and in fact, the ensemble data showed this, uh, that in fact uh, there is a higher antibody and therefore immunogenicity response in the younger age group. Um, uh, the, the stratum over the age of 65 did show lower antibody responses, but still enough antibody response to be protective. Um, over. Um, thank you for that. And the question on um, the, 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 the side effects um, thereafter, when can someone take after they've tested positive for COVID? Um, and there is another question that then followed up, um, asking also to say, look, how do I judge? Um, because there are people who are who want some form of adverse reaction to indicate that at least they've um, amounted or mounted an immune response. And some of the questions are saying, look, I didn't have anything at all. Um, another one says, look, I was dizzy for two weeks. The one who says I didn't have anything at all is asking, um, should I be taking another dose because I've not amounted, mounted an immune response? Perhaps um, you can just touch on those um, to, 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 to just put some fears. Um, yeah, I, I, I can go, I can go for, for them yeah. and then I will- Sure, sure. Sure, yeah. come in, Dr. Funda. Yeah, in terms of side effects, uh, there is a, although there are known side effects for, for, for each of these vaccines, there are individual variations in terms of response. The fact that you've not, you have not had any side effects from the vaccine does not mean that uh, uh, you've not developed immunity or you know, immunogenicity. It doesn't mean that. It just means that you are you are obviously different. The majority are going to develop side effects and they are uh, mild to moderate, and uh, and that's uh, that's how it is. And then uh, the next question was uh, about how soon after getting COVID. The understanding is that when you've got COVID nineteen, you develop antibodies which will protect you to, for some stage. In fact, the general accepted is about three months. And then you can, after that, the antibodies tend to be, to be lowering. So then you can actually take the vaccine. Uh, you, can, you, you can take the vaccine a little later 
than people who didn't have the exposed to the COVID-19. COVID How long the immunity will stay, we, we don't know. It's debatable. People are talking about the three years, but it can be a year, it can be three. We still have to do a lot of trials and they come up with conclusive answers. I, I can't think of a trial which has given us a conclusive answer how long the immunity will last. We, are, we all don't know at, at, at this stage. Thank you. Uh, so can I give the yes, official please. line from the Sasanke team? Please, please come so, in. Yes. So the official line is that safety data of vaccine beyond 28 days of last sy symptom is uh, good and repeat vaccination is permitted. And my own personal line I'll repeat is that I would uh, think in somebody who has had been hospitalized or had severe COVID, I would wait 90 days, but that's not the Sasanke line. The Sasanke line, the study permits vaccination after 28 days uh, after the last symptom of COVID. Over. Thank you very much. Um, I think if we answered the issue on um, thrombonbolic disease, um, is, it, is it certainly we have not received anything regarding the JNJ vaccine? Um, and as the, the article um, states, it is the AstraZeneca vaccine. Perhaps another question that sure. was asked is, yes, what has sure. happened to AstraZeneca vaccines as well? Thanks. Um, so I, I, this thromboembolic piece, I haven't had a chance to read the literature properly, but every clinician amongst us will know that COVID is, um, one of the complications of COVID is thromboembolic disease. Indeed, when I read the post-mortem literature, up to 40% of patients that have died of COVID have had either capillary thromboembolic disease or major thrombi and major emboline. So I think we need to be careful of the quotes that the, that the thromboembolic disease related was related to the vaccine. Uh, and I certainly will be reading that literature with interest. It is not a known complication of a Johnson Johnson vaccine. We have not seen it in the clinical trials in phase two and three, and we have not had a adverse rep uh, event report through the safety desk of Sasanke that um, um, speaks to thr thromboembolic disease, over. Thank you very much. I'm going to pose then the final closing questions. Um, and then what we will do, um, as I have committed here in is to instruct our, um, our marketing team um, and communications department to draft, um, collate basically um, all the questions that have been put here um, and compile a document that will answer each individually um, and specifically speak to the major issues that are requested here. The last, um, well, maybe let's put three questions. Um, one, a colleague is asking, and I'm seeing a number who are asking, when a pharmacist, um, you know, getting best vaccinated, Lance, um, a, 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 a colleague um, is asking, how do allied health workers register, you know, um, e, e, for this vaccination? Because when he looks at these this permit, um, in the registration process, Lance says, no, it requires an MP number, not, um, for example, you know, an HPCS number for the allied workers. So we're only focusing on doctors, um, when are pharmacists gonna be included, when are allied um, staff going to be included in this? So this speaks to the process, that's the one question. Um, and perhaps we can then take that. And then what I will do then with the other questions as I have, um, put it, you know, con um, committed is that we will then answer all of them. I mean, you know, with a, a a document that we will send out tomorrow. What I will ask who's who's willing to take that question. After which, I'm going to go through each panelist and ask you just to make your closing remarks so that we may close in time, respecting those who have joined and secured the time there. Thank you very much. Would like to take the question on that. When are the allied workers um, and pharmacists going to be included, or are they included? Dr. Musonda, you are unmuted. Yes, yes, yes. And I see yeah, that. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. Yeah, the remember the 
vaccination process is the three phase. The first phase is healthcare workers, and healthcare workers means everybody. It means the, the doctors, the nurses, allies, pharmacists. However, the categorization is that in category one, you now take the people who are doing aerosol generating procedures. So these are procedures such as the, you know, people in theater who are doing intubations, you know, those who are collecting, even the, the COVID-19 swabs, those who are doing that, the dentists who are, whose patients have to open their mouths and all that. So all those who will be category one, those who are doing aerosol generating procedures. Then, in fact, they are calling it category 1A. Then category 1B will then be those who are running the COVID wards, you know, and the uh, patients, I mean, doctors like that who are running the COVID wards, and also those who are running uh, people under investigations, you know, PUIs, you know. And then category 1C then is going to be those, those doctors who are seeing any other patients and not necessarily COVID patients. And then category two is all the health workers. I mean, whether you're a security person or in the garden, as long as you're a health worker, you fall under that category two in the new, that's how they have now revised the categorizations. It used to be one to four, now it's one A, one B, one C, and then in category two. So that's the, those are the ones. So everybody is involved. The only thing is that the category one and two are, are going first. And then after that, there will be the threes, then the fours. Fours are people in the offices, actually, you know. The category, category two will be people in the offices, and those will go very last. But the phase one is for all health workers. So don't be, uh, don't, don't be uh, worried, because we are all going to be vaccinated at some stage. You just have to wait for your time. And the, the principles know how agent it is and they are working day and night to ensure that everybody gets vaccinated we have time targets we have we've got and we need to meet those so that is a, about that then the was there another i think that was the only question eh? the, Chair. That the question um yes. I saw prof ian sign also unmuted did you have a contribution prof um so we it is progressive and uh, we are focused on the um, ICUs and COVID wards, et cetera, first. Um, we've described the additional out-of-hospital um, practitioners that are included now. And I would repeat that the V for healthcare workers uh, process is the partnership that SAMA has made with uh, the V for healthcare workers team to um, register uh, practitioners uh, to import that, that data and assure that the uh, private sites around the country and some of the government sites around the country are ready to receive those healthcare workers. The extension to, to other healthcare workers, pharmacy, pharmacists, et cetera, and allied health workers so physios do fit into the first, into the 1A, 1B category uh, from, that Dr. Mosondo had described. Uh, and um, the other allied uh, and pharmacists, et cetera, will uh, be coming shortly. We anticipate somewhere between 800,000 formerly employed healthcare workers and 1.5 million or 700,000 otherwise healthcare workers will be vaccinated in a combination of Sasonke and the uh, Pfizer vaccine rollout of the Department of Health. Uh, so we can only accommodate 500,000. Uh, uh, there is more demand than supply and we are, we are doing the best that we can. Uh, the vaccines, once they hit the country, we, we can be assured are distributed within 24 hours and, and administration of the new supply of vaccine begins within 24 hours th thereafter. Um, I, I do think that we will be calling for ever increasing populations of healthcare workers to be vaccinated. Uh, and um, as we still have about 200,000 dose, 200 to 240,000 doses of vaccine coming over the next three weeks. Um, thank you, Chip. Thank you. 
very much for, for those answers. Really appreciate the time. Really appreciate all colleagues for taking your time to join in respect for your time um, as well, you know, time for your families and not to take you away from your work. Um, we will close the meeting now at 1900 hours as we had promised to do so. Thank you very much once again for joining us. I must, um, you know, give just some extra thanks to our panelists, um, Professor Ian San, I really thank you, you know, for really taking your time to, to, to come here and explain to us. Um, this is really much appreciated. Prof San is active each and every day, always giving an update in one of the groups that we have, I think Health and New Dawn, there's always a very active group and is always updating and giving us information um, regarding that. Um, Dr. Musonda, thank you very much um, for joining us, sir, and giving us also, you know, perspective um, and, and tackling most of the questions. And thank you for the work that you are doing. And, and to Dr. Kutsia as well, the chairperson of SAMA, really appreciate um, the time, you know, that you have taken. I will just give you um, uh, 30 seconds each to make your closing remarks and then we'll close the session. Dr. Kutsia, I'll start with you. Thank you so much. And again, thank you for this. Uh, I think I got it wrong with the six months, but um, vaccination, um, to be vaccinated after you had your uh, COVID-19. Um, uh, Prof Sane, I, I'm actually more comfortable with, with for him with 90 days. But if I can uh, again ask you all, please vaccinate. Please register on both the platforms. It makes it easier on um, for healthcare workers for SAMA to communicate with you. On the GP side, we communicate through the Unity Forum. We also got the allied workers to go and, work and vaccinate through that because SAMA realized that we are not only there for our doctors, but we are there for doctors that's non-SAMA members. We are also there to help and assist our allies. That is actually um, our right and left hands when we are working in a hospital setup. And again, I want to thank Ian I want to thank John for tonight and also um, Eddie and you and your branch um, for allowing this wonderful webinar. And I, I only know that we need more of this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angie. Really appreciate that. Um, John, Dr. Musonda, please, closing remarks, sir. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Dr. Nguenya. Dr. Nguenya happens to be our, our branch chair. <laughs> And uh, yeah, is a is a very is a loved leader. So thank you very much for for tonight. And I also want to thank Dr. Kosia, Prof. Sena. Uh, it's been a great great evening. But for the participants, I just want to say that uh, uh, the program is uh, is running, and now it's running very fast. Phase one continues. And uh, it will accelerate very quickly in the, in the next few weeks. But phase two has also started in terms of preparation. We are going to deal with the larger population now, the community. We want to go into the community and we want to get it right first time. So there's a lot of planning taking place. There's the men and women who are putting their lives online so that the vaccination process takes place in a record time. So thank you very much for your support. And please be patient. This process is about being patient and we'll get it right soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Musonda. I'm always, always, always there to, to assist the fellow member um, in our branch council. Um, Prof. Sane, I'm giving it over to you for your closing remarks, sir. Um, thank you very much. I think this was an incredibly fast exercise in uh, to demonstrate that vaccines can actually be brought to South Africa and deployed rapidly. Uh, we, uh, there's a massive team of sites, uh, uh, clinical research sites involved and a massive team of vaccinators involved and we thank them all for their patience. And my last comment is that one of the most uh, impressive brands, I think worldwide is Nike. And uh, Nike is so impressive because there are many brand advocates and we are hoping that our general practitioners will become advocates for vaccination and inform uh, yourselves, all of our doctors and practitioners will inform yourselves of the 
uh, benefits of vaccination to ensure that uh, we encourage the general population to vaccinate uh and with voices that are just a bit louder than the anti-vaxxers uh thank you very much ladies and gentlemen without further ado it is 1900 hours thank you thank you very much for joining us may you have a pleasant evening um and 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 successful um week ahead thank you